Please rise as we meet our word. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. You see, the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to still another one talent, each according to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. The servant who had received the five talents immediately put them to work and gained five more talents. In the same way, the servant who had received the two talents gained two more. But the servant who had received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The servant who received the five talents came and brought five more talents. He said, Master, you entrusted five talents to me, and see, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The servant who received the two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents, and see, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the servant who received one talent came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And since I was afraid, I went away and hid your talent in the ground. And see, you have what is yours. His master answered him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter seed. Well then, You should have deposited my money with the bankers so that when I came, I would get my money back with interest. Take the talent away from him and give it to the servant who has the ten talents, because everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Throw that worthless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to God. Please be seated. Our sermon text is this same text from Matthew chapter 25, printed on page 9 in your worship folder so you can follow along. Dear Christian friends, the scripture before us today isn't really about buried treasure, but it often becomes that for us. Jesus, again, is painting another picture of the kingdom of heaven. That is, Christ's reign in the hearts and lives of his believers throughout all time and all places. And he describes the master going off on a long journey, similar to the picture that we saw last week. And during this time in between, this time of waiting, as we heard last week, we aren't just twiddling our thumbs. Right? Last week we heard we're being watchful. We want to be prepared, but here we also see that it is a time of faithful service. Jesus paints the picture of a master sharing his possessions, actually entrusting his possessions to his servants, and he gives to each one of them according to their ability. He isn't stingy in this either. Now, you've probably heard the saying before, God won't give you more than you can handle, which isn't actually in the Bible, but that's a discussion for another time. But here we see that God definitely gives you gifts according to what you can handle. In fact, apparently, he thinks we can handle quite a bit because a talent of gold is estimated by some to be about 15 to 20 years worth of wages. So think about that for a minute. The average annual wage here in South Dakota, $39,000 a year, that works out to about $790,000 for just one, just one talent. The simple point is this. None of us are given nothing from the Lord. All of us are given something and actually quite an abundance from the Lord. He blesses each of us with talents, abilities, skills, time, 
possessions? But did you catch whose possessions these all are in verse 15? Go ahead and look at it again. Whose possessions are they? What? His. His possessions. That gives us pause, doesn't it? Because we always think about my possessions, right? Our possessions. But these things, all, all of them belong to him. Therefore, it's important for us to take stock of what he has given us. Now, before we're tempted to say, well, I I haven't really been given much, remember how significant just one talent is in this parable. We are often given over to comparing our gifts with what others have been given. But whenever we do this, we are denying the generosity of the talent that God has given to us. An overabundance. Plus, the issue in the end isn't how much each one of these individuals gained with what they were entrusted with. It was whether they were faithful in using what was entrusted to them. Last week, we heard how we can't be prepared for someone else, right? You can't believe for someone else. Each of us must be prepared for our Savior's return. You can't believe on behalf of someone else. Similarly, whether or not someone else is using their gifts faithfully, that is between them and God. The focus for you is never how much or how little, the focus for you and for me, no matter how much or how little we have been entrusted with, is not how it compares to someone else's, but whether or not you are using what has been entrusted to you. Whether or not we are being faithful with his possessions, seeing all that we have, not as our own, but his How am I using it for his kingdom? And yet, what are we tempted to do again and again? As we volunteer for something, we look around and we say, well, how come I'm the only one working here? How come I'm the only one doing these things? No. How come somebody else doesn't help more? That is between them and God. He will worry about whether others are faithful with their gifts. You Look at the gifts that the Lord has entrusted to you and use them faithfully. The gifts he has entrusted to us, which, if we are honest, are way more than we ever consider or acknowledge. And this is where buried treasure comes in. Our biggest problem with all that Jesus entrusts us with is that like the servant who was given the one talent, we are often tempted to bury it. And we're not just tempted to bury it, but we do bury it. The man who buried his master's possessions said he did it because he was afraid of him. His opinion of the master was that he was hard, he was unjust, but all of that is a flat-out lie. If he was really afraid of this master, he would have done something immediately. But he didn't do anything with it. He just sat on it. He buried it in the ground. And the master sees through all of his lies and calls it like it is. The servant is wicked and lazy, and he is cast out. A picture of going to hell. Jesus is not saying, now listen carefully, he is not saying that if you don't do enough for him, then he's going to send you to hell. That is probably often a takeaway of this parable. And that is not what he is saying. That is the way that many think. Many think Christianity works this way. But the problem here is why this man buries the treasure and doesn't use his master's possessions. He doesn't understand that he has the best and most gracious master ever. And because he doesn't understand this, he doesn't really know the heart of, of his master, and he doesn't love him. Think of how different your work has been when maybe you had a boss that you really cared for versus a boss that maybe you didn't get along with very well and maybe they didn't treat you very well or something like that. And I'm willing to bet that it affected 
the quality of your work, or at least the attitude that you had when you went about that work, and how faithful we were in doing that work. So, this is a big deal when we have been burying the treasures of our Lord's possessions. And there is a dark and ugly reason behind our doing this. And it comes from our sinful nature that does not love God and does not understand his grace for us and doesn't want to understand his grace for us. And as a result, we are inclined to bury the treasures that God has entrusted to us. So think about that this week. How have I been burying the Lord's treasures entrusted to me? How have I been doing that? Sometimes we just ignore these things. It's almost as though we are afraid to find out just how much the Lord has blessed us with because it may mean that there is so much more that we could be doing to serve Him instead of myself. And so we just don't want to know, right? Ignorance is bliss. Jesus calls that what it is, wicked and lazy. Sometimes we imagine that these treasures from the Lord really only belong to us, that we are entitled to them. You know, Lord, living in this broken world, it's kind of miserable sometimes, and so I deserve some blessings from you to keep me going, right? To keep my head above water. And so we become mere consumers of his blessings, rather than stewards of them. We forget, or we don't even bother to know, the mission of his kingdom, which is to bring the light of the gospel to the ends of the earth in a personal way, one heart at a time. So in case you didn't know, now you know. That's what it is. There's no ignoring it anymore. But when we do ignore this, I mean, think about it. It's like having all of the best gear for mountain climbing, but only using it to string up a hammock. That would be silly. It's like having an all-terrain vehicle, but only using it to go back and forth from your house to the corner convenience store to get a snack. That would be silly. Sometimes we bury these gifts entrusted to us Because we just despise what he has given to us. Because we're so caught up comparing our gifts with that of others. This can happen especially as seasons in our life change. There were maybe many things as you get older that you used to be able to do, but now you physically can't so much anymore. Now, maybe, however, you have the gift of being available more than you ever did before. Maybe you have the gift of time more than you ever did before. Maybe you have the gift of time to listen to someone, to come alongside someone who is suffering or struggling. Maybe you have time like never before for prayer. Prayer that lifts up the hands of your pastor and your brothers and sisters in Christ and missionaries around the world. People who do things that maybe you can't or go places that you can't. I know there have been times in my ministry when I have totally taken for granted the prayers of God's apartment-bound saints. But by God's grace, I see more and more that my work depends on them and their faithful prayers. And that the existence of a place like hope and the success of the gospel message that goes out from places like this wouldn't happen if it were not for their faithful prayers too. Just when you thought that your time of doing the most significant work in Christ's kingdom had passed away, God shows you that some of the most important work may be just beginning for you. We struggle with burying all of these things because our sinful nature, let's call it like it is, is wicked and lazy through and through. We forget who our master is and what he is like. He is not harsh. He is gracious. 
Even in our Isaiah text today, after listing the whole litany of Israel's wickedness, what does he say? Page back a little bit in your worship folder to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Look at what he says there. That's worth circling and underlining in your Bible, too. He says, all the ways that they have been wicked, and now what does he say? Come now, let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is the joy of your master, your redemption, the washing away of your sin. We have the best master that you could possibly imagine. In Jesus, we have even more than a ten-talent servant. Jesus was perfectly faithful to his Father in all ways that we have never been. He did that specifically for you, so that trusting in him, we are not condemned. So that the end of this parable, where the wicked and lazy servant is thrown out to where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, is not your end and my end too. We have the most amazing master. The wicked and lazy servant refused to acknowledge the heart of his master, who would even have forgiven him. But your master, Jesus, lived, died, and rose again so that we can even run to him for mercy for all the times that we too have been wicked and lazy when it comes to using all the gifts that he has entrusted to us, we get to run to him for mercy. And what does he do? He is all mercy. That is his joy, to forgive you, to reconcile you to your gracious God. This grace changes everything. Paul says it well in Romans chapter 12, our second lesson today. Turn there to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And look at that verse again. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, and here's what you can underline in your Bibles, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In view of God's mercy. That's what the third servant didn't have, right? Not only has he given us our body and life, not only has he saved our souls and completely changed our eternity, but he has now equipped us to share in his reign and his joyous work of bringing this mercy to still other hearts and minds. And this means that everything that we are and everything that we have and everything that we do is an opportunity to give praise and thanks and glory to him. In view of his mercy, I want to dig up that treasure of his that I have so often buried again and again. I want to identify the gifts that he has given to me as he brings them into my life. I want my eyes to be open to the countless opportunities that he puts into my life so that I can use them directly or indirectly for his kingdom work. Because that is my purpose too. Because it is the joy of our master. In view of his mercy, I want to share in his joy. The joyful work of bringing this gospel to yet one more person so that they can know the heart and promises that he has made to them too. The joyful work of building a relationship with them that I can bring Jesus into. That they might hear and believe. In view of his mercy, I want to put all that he has entrusted me with to work immediately, like that first, the first two faithful servants who immediately put those gifts to work. Why wait? What are we waiting for? There's no good reason to wait one more moment. There's so much emphasis on trying to find a job these days that gives us purpose and is fulfilling in some way. But because of your master's love for you, you know your purpose no matter what your task is. And that is to share in the joy of our Savior King reigning in the hearts of his people. 
in your own heart and potentially in the hearts of those around you. So, this week, what buried treasures of your master will you dig up? Don't go back to them in guilt and shame, but dig them off in the peace of forgiveness. Dust them off and delight in finding ways to put them to use for his kingdom yet again. Amen. Now the, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and mind through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.